Welcome, dear brothers and sisters. This is our um, Celtic Orthodox Church discussion group. This is our fifth week, and this week we're going to be discussing the, the Holy Spirit and grace, and it falls on a wonderful day because today is the Feast of Pentecost, and so we have this wonderful uh, convert, uh, conjunction of um, life in the Spirit, uh, life in the church, and, um, and Pentecost, the Holy Spirit. So let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Lord Jesus, we ask that you be with us, that you open our hearts and minds to be more receptive to your word and your will for our lives. Send your Holy Spirit now to be with us, to bind us together, and to help us to absorb the truth of your holy word. These things we pray through your most precious name. You, Lord Jesus, who live and reign with God, the Almighty Father, and the Holy Spirit, one God, unto the ages of ages. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So today we're going to try a different approach than our normal um, lecture question. I'm going to do the lecture. We're going to be videoing um, and recording. And then at the end, we'll turn off the, um, the video recording and we'll, we'll take questions uh, from the participants. But really today, what we're going to uh, discuss is how does everything fit together? How, do, how does the church work and how does grace work within our lives and within the church? And what is our goal and what is theosis and what is the reason that we become Christian? So with that in mind, we'll start out here. Now, way over here, at this end of the spectrum, we've got a little baby who's just been born and he is or she is happy to be alive and just exceedingly joyful everything is wonderful except maybe the bright lights of the hospital ceiling but everything's going along wonderfully now that baby it, it's got a life and it's going to change and it's going to grow and it's got this path that it's going to follow through the through the through the years and at the end we've kind of got a fork in the road and we got to figure out what's going to happen when this poor child gets here at this point in life and sitting in this big rocking chair and getting ready to doze off. There's a couple of things, potential. One, there's an upward path we call heaven, and there's a downward path called hell. So these are the two possible goals here. There are really no other goals heaven or hell, one or the other. And so this life that one leads from birth to death is going to help focus that individual on whether they go up or they go down. So along this way, God has given certain milestones, certain things to help the individual on their path. And we're going to look at some of those today and see how they fit in to this ultimate goal. Now, before we do that, I'm just going to say we, we're using the word heaven, but really I want to use also the word theosis. And you've heard this term a number of times, but theosis is our 
unity with God. That's what heaven is all about. Being unified, being becoming one with our maker. Now, I see that this is kind of small on my screen. Hopefully, you've got it bigger on yours or you can blow it up to see it. Uh, but I'm going to try to write just a little bit bigger. Um, so hopefully, we'll be able to see better. So let's start right here. We're going to start with birth. And birth is one of those necessary things that we all must experience. That's the starting point. Birth is our bodies coming into the world, coming into existence. It is the material emergence of our physical bodies. Now, the thing about birth is that we have been formed prior to birth, that our bodies were growing and building themselves within our mothers, within a sack of water. And there's a connection here between the water and the material and the birth that happens. And we'll see this played out as we continue to talk. The birth is the material emergence of our bodies. But what happens after birth? Well, what's the first thing that the doctor wants done? He wants the baby to take a breath. It's extremely important. The very next step, the next, before they do anything else, they try to clear the lungs of any residual fluid and get the baby to breathe. The baby doesn't breathe, that's not good. So breath is a next essential element for human life. We must breathe. Without breath, we would, we would die. There's a three by three by three rule. Can't go more than three minutes without breath, more than three days without water, or more than three weeks without food, generally speaking. So breath is exceedingly important for human life. But once the baby is born and breathing, then what comes next? What's the next logical step? Yeah, they'll probably get the baby cleaned up, wrap it up in some uh, nice snuggly clothes, but pretty much the very next thing that happens is they want the baby to eat, to take nourishment from mom, normally speaking, but this is the next step that we all depend upon nourishment. We must eat. So this is a third necessity for all human life. Birth. Birth meaning we have a material body. Breath. We breathe oxygen in and out, and we eat. These are three very important necessities. Now, another necessity is that we establish bonds with other humans. And we do this first in family. It's what's next in the order here is that we start making bonds with our family. We start building these interpersonal connections, which prepare us to later make connections in the larger community. This is extremely, extremely important. None of us can live without human connection. 
It is impossible. And someone might raise their hand and say, hey, what about the hermits? They live all by themselves. And, and, and Well, if you think about it, even hermits started their life within the context of family, within the context of community. Community is vitally important to us. We are so connected and interdependent. Think of it in terms of how you live. I didn't make this. I, I don't have the ability to make my own clothes. I have to rely on someone else to do that for me. I can't make my own shoes or my own automobile. Most of us don't even grow our own food. We're interconnected. We depend on farmers and grocers and tailors and all of these different functions in our community to help us live. Community is vitally important to the human experience. But we also know that in our human experience, community needs some order. It needs some way to monitor and govern those who might take advantage of others. And we call this government. I'm just going to um, abbreviate here G-O-V-T, but government. We need government. We need order, structure to our society. And we see this all the way back through the history of man. Another thing that the human race needs is propagation of the species. So This is so vitally important. That's how we continue. That's how the human race survives. And we go from generation to the next generation to the next generation. And so there's a, there's a handing on of life from one generation to the next. And finally, the human life, the seventh element that's critical for human life is medicine. We are all subject to certain illnesses. Our, we're, not, we're not made of steel. We, we cut ourselves, we bruise ourselves, we fall. All of these things happen and we need medicine that treats and helps our bodies to heal. These are seven very, very, very critical and fundamental aspects of our life on earth as humans. Now, we know that we have a life here on earth. And we kind of see that at the beginning. We live this life, but we also know that we have this endpoint, this goal where we will experience a new type of life in the afterworld, in heaven, in theosis. And so if we look, I believe we will start to see a picture emerge of a vital connection between our human life on earth and a spiritual life that we begin to develop as we begin to follow Christ. 
and to receive into our lives the Holy Spirit. Now, when we talk about beginning to follow Christ and what that means and receiving the Holy Spirit, we, we begin to think about our conversion being led to a point where we say, yes, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Messiah sent into the world, that you are the Son of God. The Bible teaches us that we cannot make that profession unless the Holy Spirit allows us to. Unless the Holy Spirit illuminates our minds in such a way that we can perceive the truth of that statement. And this is the beginning of God's revelation of himself to each of us. This is the beginning of our spiritual journey. In the olden days, when someone would come forward to become a member of the church, to begin a, a life following Jesus Christ, the priest, the, the presbyter, the bishop, or, or, or some minister would take this individual into a body of water. It, not a stagnant pond that was over covered with, with algae and moss, but, but into a body of water, normally um, a river, uh, sometimes an ocean, sometimes a large lake, but they would go into the body of water and the person was immersed completely immersed in the water three times in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son and in the name of the Holy Spirit. So the person is immersed into the water. Now the priest or the bishop would hold that person under the water. They would hold them and hold them, and hold them, until they began to twitch a little bit. And they knew it was time. They would bring them up. What was the first thing that person's going to do? Gasp for air. Gasp for air. And once they'd gotten a good breath, they would go back down again the second time. Hold them, hold them, hold them bring them up again, again they gasp for air. Three times this occurred. What were they doing? What was the significance of this somewhat dramatic action that they would take during the baptismal ceremonies? It was done for one specific reason. It was to instill within the minds of all of the witnesses and of the person being baptized a connection between spiritual rebirth in baptism and the birth that each of us has experienced being born into the world. Because we're born from a sack of water and one of the first things that we do we take a breath. And so this process was designed to help the Christians understand you are being born again. You are being born anew. You are starting a new life. Yes, you still have your physical life, but now you've got a spiritual life. And so the first thing we start out with in our Christian life is baptism.
And of course, this, we're, we're baptized in the water, we're brought up out of the water. We see the connection, we see the distinct connection with our material birth. We're being born a second time. Now, baptism, we know, is indeed a plunging into death, being buried with Christ, and rising again to new life. This is important because we participate spiritually in Christ's death and in his resurrection. Remember, water not only is life-giving, and in fact, if we look at the world, 70% water, our bodies, roughly 70% water. We know that at the creation, God's spirit moved on the face of the water. When we look at water, the molecule even has a certain reflection of the Trinity, H2O, two hydrogens and one oxygen. It takes on three forms, a solid when it's ice, liquid, and gas. So water, we can perceive clearly has a connection with the Trinity. It has a special connection. And so we're born of water from our mother's womb. We're born again of water through baptism. This is one of the essential parts of our spiritual journey. Second, if you look at the word breath, and we look at that word as used in Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, that word has a double sense. Pneuma, in Greek, Ruha, in Hebrew, and Rotka, in Aramaic, I believe, and in my pronunciations are probably horrible. If anyone out there is listening and they know any of these languages, forgive me. But those are essentially the, the three words. Those three words have two meanings. They mean breath, and they also mean spirit. And this is interesting. The concept was the breath of man is his spirit, his life. And when his breath is gone, his life is gone. So there was a great connection in the ancient world between breath, spirit, life. We see this also in our understanding here of chrismation. Chrismation is our, one of the second fundamental elements of our Orthodox life. And it is when the priest or the bishop calls down upon the newly baptized, the Holy Spirit. Now, you will hear said that we receive the Holy Spirit in baptism. We do, absolutely. You will hear that we receive the Holy Spirit in chrismation. We do, absolutely. But how do we, how do we perceive because we're going to see that there's a lot of times when we receive the Holy Spirit, not just these two times. How, how is it that we keep receiving the Holy Spirit over and over again, and are they different? And, and how? Well, yes, there are different gifts, different aspects of the Holy Spirit that are communicated to us. 
perhaps we can look at baptism as being a communication of the Holy Spirit that empowers us to begin a life of personal sanctification, changing our lives, becoming more and more like Christ, being obedient unto his word and doing what he would have us do. In chrismation, however, if we can compare it to Pentecost, we see that the disciples and apostles, they received the Holy Spirit, but they were given different gifts that had to do with proclaiming Christ as the Messiah and teaching and increasing the flock, witnessing to the truth of Christianity. It was a spirit that emboldened them. Look at what had occurred. After Jesus' death, they were locked up. They had the doors locked. They were afraid of the Jewish people. They didn't want them to come in. They wanted to keep them out. They were afraid. But what happens at Pentecost? They're no longer afraid. They are boldly proclaiming the word, the gospel, the truth. And we see many times the Holy Spirit in Scripture is referred to as the Spirit of Truth. This is our voice. This is our voice. Yes, we have the Holy Spirit at baptism. We begin a life of personal sanctification, seeking holiness through the precepts taught by Jesus Christ. But in chrismation, we're given a voice. We're given a voice to speak, to witness. Next, we must eat. And we're given spiritual food. Eucharist is our spiritual food. It is the very body and blood of Christ. We believe that the Eucharist is indeed not only bread and wine, but also the body and blood of Christ. Remember, Christ had two natures. He was fully human. He had a human body, a human will, a human soul, he, and a human spirit, but he was also fully divine. He was one with the Father. He had two natures. His body and blood, in a sense, have two natures. They are both bread and wine, and body and blood all at the same time. This is a mystery. All of these things here are mysteries that we don't understand. This is a mystery. Now, if you think back to the time when Jesus was celebrating that last supper with his apostles, they, they were supposedly celebrating Passover. Now, what was missing? Well, Passover, that was the time when the Jews, the Jewish priests would sacrifice all of the lambs. But remember, once a sacrifice is made, that sacrifice must be offered up to the Father. You can't just make the sacrifice and leave it on the altar. And we see this reflected in the temple practices, that the animal is sacrificed, and the sacrifice is made by draining the blood, separating the blood from the animal, separating the body and the blood. And then the animal is offered up to God. And usually it was done by fire. 
And for this reason, they kept a fire burning on the temple on the top 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They, they had a priest specifically assigned to that duty. Of course, they rotated through the day, but they kept that fire going. When the sacrifice was done, it was offered up. On special occasions, the, the priest or even the, lay, the, the, the people of the, the faith, the Jewish people, were allowed to consume the sacrifice. And Passover was one of these very special occasions when everybody got to participate in the royal priesthood. They were allowed to consume the sacrifice. So the sacrifice had to be consumed in one of two ways. Right? Fire or consumed by eating. So on this particular Passover, Christ is gathered with his disciples, his apostles, and they're celebrating Passover, but where is the Passover lamb? It's not mentioned in scripture. What is mentioned is the body and blood of Christ. And he's told them already, look in St. John chapter 6, read St. John chapter 6, read it twice, read it slowly, meditate on it. That's where he tells them, my body is true food and my blood is true drink. And unless you eat of my body and drink of my blood, you have no part in me. So this is critical. Our Eucharist, it is not only our spiritual food, but it is also the sacrifice that we offer to God the Father. Why? Why do we offer sacrifice? We offer sacrifice in thanksgiving because we've been redeemed. You see, a sacrifice could be offered up for many things, for a petition, for a particular need or a want, for um, praise, for thanksgiving, um, in an atonement for sin, all of these things. So this is our Eucharist. This is our, our offering of a sacrifice made in thanksgiving for God's salvation. It is our atonement. Not propitiation. We'll, we may have already talked about this. We'll talk about it again later. But our atonement, reconciliation with God, making peace and being thankful for what we've been given. So this is the Eucharist. Now, what happens, we, we talked about family and communion. What happens when community breaks down? When community breaks down, ceases to function, we see rioting. We see war. We see division. Spiritually, what happens when we sin? When we intentionally, not out of bad habit, not out of negligence, not out of um, hurt. Yes, when we sin, we sin. But there are times when we sin that are sins of weakness. And there are times when we sin when it is a premeditated turning against God. We no longer want him in our lives. And we want to do what we want to do. In those times, we, we're breaking the communion. We're, we're rupturing this wonderful relationship that we have. Now, it's not ruptured completely because God doesn't leave us. And he says that those that 
to come to him. They're not going to be snatched out of his hand easily. But there is a, a rupture. There's a rupture that happens that causes brokenness and for which we need healing. And this sacrament called confession It restores community. It restores our life of grace. It brings us back into wholeness as God intended. Scripture says, confess your sins one to another that you may be healed. It is for our healing. For our continued forgiveness. And if you're not in a practice of doing so, confession, I urge everyone, confession, once a month. Once a month. If if you are if you are already chrismated, baptized, chrismated, you should be seeking confession once a month. At least that's that's a minimum, um, but technically, we we can't all do that. We don't we don't have that possibility. But we can speak offline about other options that are available. Um, that we can we can work with each of you so that we can get confession to you if you desire it. Now. Part of this this. Um, th this path that we're following, if we're baptized, we're chrismated, we're, we're receiving um, the Eucharist, we're living in community both with God and with our fellow Christians, then we're part of church. And church is the so society of believers. And just like the society of the human family, the so society, the society of Believers requires some form of government. And we call this holy orders. That certain men are called out to be bishops, priests, deacons, lectors, acolytes, um, exorcists, porters, these, so some of the later ones I mentioned, those are called minor orders, the higher orders, uh, priest, uh, bishop, the deacon, those are the higher, the three higher orders. Um, but these are really our form of, of self-governing, and they help us to maintain order. And they also help uh, convey um, these sacraments uh, because they are, that's the, that's the method by which the sacraments are administered is through those men who have holy orders. Of course, let us not forget that we, we, need, we need the faith to continue, but we need a way that husband and wives can be bound not only in the natural order of things, which would be a natural pairing of a husband and wife, but we also need them to have a spiritual life, and we call that holy matrimony, or just simply marriage. And so the two come together, they become as one. Christ says, let what God has joined to, uh, together, let no man take apart. But these, this is the binding of two lives together. And then purpose is for procreation. That is the purpose for which marriage exists. But in marriage, 
you have three people. You have the husband, you have the wife, and you have the Holy Spirit. And you have a unity. And from this unity, the love of husband and wife is open to conception and to birth. And this is how we recognize the, the need for the propagation of the species, but in a way that believers to baptize people come together in a special sacramental way. It's not possible to have holy matrimony, the sacrament of holy matrimony between a non-believer and a believer. Yes, there can, be, there can be a blessing, there can be a union, but it's a natural union. But once you have two believers who join together, this is a higher level of union, a higher level of the sacrament that binds the two together. And then, of course, we need, we need medicine. We need healing. And that is the sacrament of anointing. Um, I'm just going to call it sacred oil. We have many um, incidents of, of this anointing taking place and the laying on of hands for healing in the New Testament. We see that, that our spirits, once they are healed and they come into right relationship with God, that the healing flows also to our material bodies. And we begin to see that in the same way that marriage, there's a great connection between the spiritual and the physical. Here also there's a great connection between the spiritual and the physical. And the church believes that those who receive the sacrament of the sacred oil, the sacrament of anointing, they are, one, forgiven of all their sins, and two, we believe that there is new life that's given to them physically as well, and that if it's God's will, their bodies will recover from whatever ailment has taken them. So this the sacred oil, the, 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 the anointing of the sick, this should not be reserved for the last moments of life. This should be open to anyone, anyone who's having a surgery, anyone who's having um, a, a particular illness, uh, anyone. It should be open, it should be available. And it is highly encouraged any time, and even for, um, you know, for those who might have uh, people in their families who suffer from mental illness, this is a sacrament that can, that can bring much healing, even in the area of mental illness, uh, illness as well. So this is, this is our connection here between our spiritual life and our physical life. We can see these correlations, these lines drawn between the two very clearly. God's purpose and plan and outline. Now, the, the church, the Orthodox Church teaches that these are the primary seven sacraments. And the sacrament is a means by which God's grace flows to the individual. It's 
It's a means of transmission of God's grace. Now, the Orthodox Church sees God's grace as being uncreated. But this is, this is actually through this, these sacraments, God is transmitting himself, communicating himself to us. And of course, grace helps us to live in communion with God, to resist sin and temptation, and to take on holiness and righteousness. But not by our own work, but by the work that God is doing within us. And in each one of these, we see the operation of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit of God working within our lives. These, my brothers and sisters, these are the stepping stones along this path of life that we must follow in order to make it to our goal of theosis. Now, the Orthodox Church also sees other things may be sacraments. Some might call them sacramentals, that they also communicate in some way God's grace. But we see these as the primary seven. And we're reminded of the verse in Scripture which says, wisdom has built her house on seven columns. And we believe that these are the seven columns upon which our church is built. These are the seven principal sacraments that guide us and help us being formed into our new life in the Spirit. Christ says, you must be born of water and the Spirit. We must be born anew in the Spirit of God. And isn't this exactly what Pentecost is all about? A celebration of God's most amazing gift of the Holy Spirit to all his children.